So I'm here to tell you um, my quick little story about how I learned to stop worrying and love accents. Um, part of being a type designer is drawing letters that we don't use in our everyday lives. And um, one of my favorite parts about coming to um, a type I is actually seeing talks like these, where um, you know we get to hear native speakers go in depth about the the, the letters that they do use that are that are unique to their language. Um, I th these were both from last year in Warsaw, and I, I I love these talks. And I so the reason I'm here is to kind of keep that conversation about accents going because I, I mean, accents in the Latin alphabet I should say going because I find it fascinating. Um, and if you are a native speaker who's shared your expertise in some way, doing a talk, writing an article, tweeting a tweet, whatever, um, thank you. It's really helpful to have data points from native speakers. Um, yeah, so uh, this is the part where I tell you that I'm not an expert in accents. Um, I, I am a native English speaker. I have very limited cultural background or personal experience to, to draw from. Um, I did not study this in school. I did not do a dissertation on this. Um, so I get that it's a little weird that I'm up here occupying airtime in front of an international audience to talk about a subject that um, you know I am a little bit ignorant about. <laughs> um, I, I guess as a you know native English speaker, I'm equal opportunity ignorant of all accents, <laughs> which, which I think works in my favor. Um, but that's why I titled this talk, How Not to Draw Accents. Um, the, and, and the reason I hope this is helpful to, to, to someone here is because I probably represent the majority of type, designer, type designers out there who are drawing characters that we only have a cloudy sense of like how they're actually going to be used and what's actually acceptable or unacceptable when it comes to their design. Um, I, I also kind of want to tell you my, my personal journey, because I used to think that drawing accents was a real chore, um, and it's definitely been a source of stress for me. Um, but now I see it as like a really important and fun part of my design process, rather than like merely a production task. And, and the thing that kind of helped facilitate that transformation um, was kind of learning about all the rules that go into drawing accents and then going out into the world and seeing how comically often these rules are broken. Um, so here is my journey. Um, I, why did I used to hate drawing accents? Um, not because, like, yeah, it's, it's work, um, and I don't like work, but um, uh, it, it kind of it's all more about what accents represent, which um, in, the in the development of a typeface, when accents start to get drawn is usually when the typeface is kind of moving from a design phase to a production phase. So, you know, from dynamic to static. Um, because in order for, you know, for someone to effectively draw accents, the, the basic character set has to be pretty settled, um, and, and so the fun part is over. You know, it's no longer a process of discovery, um, figuring out how this system of shapes is gonna work together, and it makes you a lot less agile, right? You know, like, I, with this number of characters, I can be quick, I can be agile, I can try things out, you know, fast and see what works and see what doesn't, but now I'm weighed down by this mass of characters, and even if I can automate them, I'm still responsible for them. Um, so if I sit, change the spacing of the A, I gotta go check all the letters that depend on the A. And if I kern these together as a group, I now have to go sure make sure accents aren't hidden things in ways that are ugly or you know just gross. Um, so my original you know, approach to accents was just to kind of slog through them as fast as I can and, you know, fill all these little boxes so that I can then go fill these little boxes and claim that I supported whatever character set or code page that I, you know, was supposed to support and not because I actually really cared about the accents at all. And this kind of approach of caring about coverage but not caring about language can kind of seep into our marketing materials sometimes. Um, I mean, this is, um, you know, a kind of a common thing. Um, these are a bunch of things, you know, like this is all how, too often how type designers can look at accents. It's just, you know, English with little thingies on top and bottom. Um, and when we present it to our users that way, I think it's a little, gets a little dangerous. Um, these are just, uh, this is like 20 minutes of me on my fonts. Um, 
So, I mean, you get a lot of, a lot of the word multilingual. Um, you get the idea. Sorry. Um, I like this one. And also this one. Um, and I, so I don't mean, to, I'm not trying to be critical of the, the designers of these typefaces. I just wanted to kind of point out this like mini meme. And you know, I just personally, I don't think it's something that's very effective in, in showing you know, what these accents are good for. Um, with one exception, John Hudson, you are awesome. <laughs> um, and I mean, John knows better than most that it's important to care about languages other than your own because, um, you know, it's typeface design is today, there's no way to escape your typeface, or very, it's pretty hard to escape your typeface being used in a language other than your own. Um, you, know, it, you know, if you go back 50 years, you know, where, where the, the markets were more localized, that maybe wasn't the case as much, but, um, you know, the, where I sell and where a lot of us sell is in a very international market. Um, so I, I've tried to learn to, to appreciate accents, and, and the way that that happened for me was travel. Um, and I really admire how accented characters can create a sense of place, and I, I really enjoy kind of going out there and hunting for diverse forms when I go to a new, a new place. Um, and this is, just, <laughs> this is just me showing my, my travel photos, pretty much. So, uh, yeah. Um, but, but it made me want to do better than just filling slots. Um, so that brings me to phase two, um, which is, you know, kind of confronting my own ignorance and kind of like carefully tiptoeing um, and trying to understand what native speakers expect to see, what they want to see, what they absolutely do not want to see. And now I have an additional source of stress because I actually want to make people happy. I want people to, I want my fonts to be usable and I don't want to piss anyone off. Um, fortunately, there are a ton of resources out there. Um, I already showed the talk from last year about the Insects project, but um, I'm just going to kind of quickly go through these. Um, I'll, I'm happy to post these more later. Um, but yeah, the Insects project is a great resource on um, Eastern European accents. Um, the Diacritics project goes through and actually details how each you know, shape by shape can be drawn. This is the page explaining you know, like the different forms of Karen that, that go next to different letters. Um, uh, a, an article in I Love Typography called On Diacritics is, is a pretty nice, um, nice piece by David Regina. Um, and also this series by uh, Bianca Burning um, about how language and, and culture can affect the design of letter forms. Um, there are also kind of more language specific um, resources. Um, Vietnamese Typography is a great one by Donnie Trung. Um, so here's he, and what I like about this one is it's not very prescriptive. He's not t saying you should do this. He's saying, hey, you can place it here. Like, so, so this is stacked accents. You can place a stacked accent in this way, or here's an, here's an example of it being this way, and it kind of goes through the different options that you have. Um, I think a lot of us in this room have used this page by Adam Twardock, um, how to draw an Ogonek, Ogonek, sorry. And um, also um, this page about drawing thorn and eth. Another interesting resource is uh, the context of diacritics, which doesn't show you how to draw accents, but shows you where letters usually get paired together in different languages. So you can see like, what actually is important to Kern. Um, and the last and um, very useful resource, you'll see some photos from this in, in later in the talk, is uh, Fancy Diacritics, the, the Flickr pool, which is curated by Florian Hardvig. Um, and, but it has contributions by a lot of people. Um, so with these resources, I kind of have been able to kind of build myself up so I'm, I feel confident that I can make accents without offending anyone. Um, but the problems with, with kind of relying too heavily on rules described by other people is first, you know, these pages were all created by individuals, whereas language are spoke, languages are spoken by communities. So, I mean, it's only one data point in a sea of opinions, and a very knowledgeable or academic view might be different than, you know, a person on the street reading a sign. And so that's why I kind of like to go to streets for inspiration. Um, I, um, you know, I, I, I love seeing signs like this, because you look at this and you're like, okay, that's like a cool O with the tilde, and you're like, okay, wait, this is taken in Stockholm, where they don't use the tilde, 
Um, so that's actually an odiaresis. And I was really surprised by that. That's my surprise face. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, like, I love this stuff. Um, you know, and, and you know, if, if I want my work in my typeface is somehow untraditional or irreverent in some way, my accents should be similarly untraditional or irre irreverent. So this kind of brings you to my current phase of accent drawing, which is uh, taking risks. Um, and learning that maybe I don't have to please everyone. Like, there are a lot of fonts out there, so maybe they can just choose another one if they don't like it so much. So um, for the purposes of this talk, I'm kind of splitting this up into three ways of taking risks with accents. Um, you know, you can reduce it to a simpler form. You can, you know, do something unique in how the accent interacts with the base character, or you can just draw it in such a unique way that it really adds extra oomph to the typeface. Um, usually with reduction, there are kind of two ways. There's either like the following, a, you know, just like how you would write the accent very quickly, or just trying to find some sort of geometric simplicity. Um, so this diaresis in Stockholm wasn't an isolated incident, I found. Um, it's like all over the place. Um, printed matter, signage, um, neon, uh, sometimes the, the, the um, diaresis was, uh, you know, like, like, like the tilde form was turned backwards, which is kind of more how you might, like, you know, if you're not picking up your pen, how it might go. Um, and I, I, so this is current shrift, and there is a mark in current shrift to distinguish the lowercase u from the n, but I think this is actually a, di a diaresis, but please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and also, you just see a diaresis that's just a straight line. Because it's like 90% of the importance of a, a diacritic is just to see something there. Um, and I mean, and so like, okay, so there are some weird script fonts that have this. But no, uh, this, is, this is legit. Um, this is the uh, government-sanctioned typeface of Stockholm, which uses uh, just a horizontal macron to represent a diaresis. And they knew they could do this because this typeface is being used to, to write Swedish. Um, another great Sweden example is um, the A-ring, you know, a, a big circle. Oh yeah, that's it in the bottom corner, by the way, for, just to reference. Um, can be reduced to just a dot. And, and this is, you know, maybe not as much a writing thing, but more of a, a, a simplicity thing. And you see it a lot with kind of, you know, your more spare sans serifs. Um, and I, I can show you, um, this is not only a European phenomenon, here are some circumflexes in Vietnam that are just triangles now, nice little hats. Um, and then I bet a lot of people who went to ATIFI last year were taking pictures like this one, or these, in Warsaw, where the Ogonek it, it either gets disconnected or simplified in, in kind of weird and unique ways. Um, yeah, and this stuff makes me very excited because I've been trying to follow the rules and then I go to the place and it's like nobody else is following the rules, so why, <laughs> why should I follow the rules? Um, so some, some actual tildes that have become straight lines, including official signage, that's the sign for the, for the airport in uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico. And um, it's even standard on highway signs in Spain to see just a, a straight line to represent a tilde. In Portuguese, which I speak a teensy bit of, um, you, you often see a tilde next to a cedilla. And so you can see that like, these can both adopt kind of a very pared down form, which makes sense for a blocky sans serif like this, or a stencil like this. And uh, th this is also true in, um, in Turkey, where the cedilla is used under the S. Um, and uh, I, I corresponded with the, um, the designer of FF Dean, um, Aubrey Jan Pohl, about this. And, and he kind of explained to me that this kind of simplification is not unlike the single story G, which was super rare, if not non existent, in typography until the 19th century. But people wrote it all the time. So it's like introducing it into a very simplified typeface makes sense. And it's not something that, that local populations will necessarily object to. They're just not used to it. Um, a quick example in my own work, um, I'm a big fan of the uh, type designer Georg Trump, and I de designed a font called Gimlet based on his work. And so I kind of 
found an essential Sedilla form that I felt represented not my interpretation of his work and kind of made it consistent throughout the typeface, whereas his weights were pretty different. Um, I've yet to see this in the wild, so someone use, use my Sedillas, please. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, interaction. Uh, so how the letters, how the accents actually interact with the letters. Um, here you can see that um, our pr one approach is just to like slice off the top of the letters that have an accent. Again, it's just important that something's there. Um, I'll, also, I don't know if you can see, but there, there are the dot belows actually on the, the, the concrete in front of it. Or, um, you know, an acute can become a, an extension of the letter itself. Or, you know, kind of integrate with the base character in a kind of unique and interesting way. Um, um, tons of umlauts like this, um, where, where, and, and where they, they kind of sink into the letter to kind of compact the, the, the line of type so that you can fit more lines above and below it. Um, they can intersect the letter. The umlaut can get turned on its side. Or it can become a negative shape in the letter. Uh, this kind of you know, com compacting is common in, um, in tabloids, especially where you're really getting lines close to each other. Um, so here, the, he, yeah, I mean, and also that Sedilla is pretty, pretty cool. Um, and um, here's a Swedish tabloid, and, and this tabloid is actually the inspiration for the, the font trim poster by um, Gurren Sunderström of uh, Letters from Sweden, where he actually included multiple sets of compact accents at different levels of compactness and negativeness and also circular versus whatever you call that shape. Um, and even an experimental reduced version. And I, I just saw this on Twitter the other day, so a last minute slide ad was um, FF Mark has um, a diaresis that actually changes throughout the weights to kind of, you know, whatever best suits that weight. And in my work, again, Garrick Trump, big inspiration. Um, he had like that little Mickey Mouse O situation, which I also included as alternates in my typeface. Uh, another uh, quick interaction thing from my own work um, was Bungie, which was designed to set vertically. And um, so the accents actually set vertically as well and take up more vertical space than the, than the normal characters. But then the base character is drawn shorter so that it's not so obvious. Does that make sense? I hope. Uh, and the other thing about vertical settings, you get weird situations where accents actually need to be kerned to other accents um, when they might otherwise hit each other. Um, the last category is elaboration. Um, you know, and this is kind of where, and this is a very ill-defined category, but it's where accents can kind of define or kind of bring the type to an, another level. Um, or, I mean, or th how this dire system now becomes a crown in the word for king. Or how this crep becomes a heart. Uh, that's a circumflex, so should be an upside down heart, but hey, who cares? It's just something. Um, elaboration doesn't need to be gimmicky or hit you over the head. I love how this vertical acute accent kind of really punctuates the verticality of the other letters. And in type, you know, like the masters of, of you know, elaborative uh, diacritics or the Czech designers like Voltic Pressig. Um, and uh, where, I mean, you can see like the Karens are like, kind of falling on their sides and, and, the, and the rings are open and kind of extend into the letters. Uh, more recently, I've really appreciated like the super thin diacritics that some sans serifs have. This is a Schick Torquez Dia and a local designer um, tri um, um, Etienne's uh, triad coffers and brasses. Uh, in my own work, for my fonts that I do for Font of the Month, I really try to actively seek out ways to make my accents special in some way. I, wa I want to find some accent that's emblematic of what the typeface is all about. Um, so this typeface is about bracketing, tapering, and shadow, and all of that is you know, kind of reflected in the sedilla. This typeface is about kind of geometry and super pointy diagonals, so I really wanted the Ogonex to follow that with that just form. Uh, and you'll see that same form in the Vietnamese hook, and, and also just like a very straight Vietnamese horn. Um, 
for me, accents have become an opportunity to make sure all the elements in my typeface actually add up to something. Because if I can't find at least one special moment in my, like, like where I could draw an accent in kind of a special or non-traditional way, maybe this typeface isn't all that special to begin with. <laughs> So it kind of makes me, you know, it's kind of like a check, you know, it's like, is this actually worth putting out there? Um, and perhaps the accents I'm most proud of are in my typeface fit, which kind of combine all the three categories, reduction, interaction, and elaboration, um, to kind of fill space. The, the idea with this font is to just fill space, whatever space is available. So the accents had to be super wide, they had to be compact, so the letters kind of respond to the accents around them. Um, and then also, this, this typeface is just so pared down that you know, the Ogonek that, you know, also gets radically simplified, as well as the uh, Cedilla, the cute um, circumflex, just a hat, and also the O gets flattened out so that there's a minimal white space or black space in this situation. Um, the tilde gets straight line. But I was a little scared about this one, so I did do an alternate tilde. <laughs> um, you know, you gotta, you gotta, I wanna make people happy still. <laughs> um, so yeah, and, and then this, the, the um, fitting also happens in Vietnamese, where the letters have to get super short to accommodate the stacked accents. And I did include an alternate set of accents, which are not fitting, in case that's what you want. And those alternate set of accents are also available for all the other accents as well. Oh, and the A-ring. The A-ring is just a dot. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much the story of how I, an English speaker, have been trying to take my accent game to the next level. Um, type today does many jobs, many of the jobs in display that lettering used to do, and that's especially true on the web. Um, so I would love to see type adopt more of these cool techniques from lettering. Um, it's a weird and wonderful world of an unusual letters out there, and I hope we can kind of use our entire character sets to reflect that. Thanks. Oh. <laughs>